sugar pie, honey bunch. You know that I love you. A little over two weeks ago, I made a video exploring the question of whether or not science had become a religion in the 21st century. Upon reviewing that video, I realized that while the information that I gave you was indeed accurate and the comparisons I made are sound and supported by evidence, the way it was presented may have left some of you with the impression that I was saying either that science isn't to be trusted or else that religion is a bad thing. That's because what I gave you was a bare bones presentation that gave you all the arguments but didn't really go into the detail needed as far as talking about uh, the background information that uh, led me to ask the questions in the first place or about the evidence itself. For example, when I was talking about the core mythologies, I made allusions to the similarities between uh, current scientific theories and various world religions beliefs, and I even gave you a link in the video description to a Reddit post where I talked a little bit about it, but I didn't really cover it in the video. Nor, when I was talking about cognitive dissonance, did I go into the detail I needed to there. In this video, I'm going to rectify that by filling in the gaps, by covering in, covering all of the uh, information that I had to leave out in the last video to save time. So stay tuned. Since I've informed so heavily on everything said in both the last video and this one, I'm going to begin filling in those gaps by taking you on a little trip down memory lane to tell you about some of my experiences with science, religion, and the topics that they both tackle. Let's get started. Our first stop on this little magical mystery tour is here. I am at the Gadsden Public Library in downtown Gadsden, Alabama. Now, while it's true that I had an education in science, religion, mysticism, and spirituality that began much earlier than in life, right here at this library is where my relationship with science and religion and the topics that they both cover really began. I used to spend hours at this library both as a child and as a younger adult where I would be checking out in one visit books on everything ranging from Darwin and Einstein to at the same time voodoo, witchcraft, UFOs, the Loch Ness Monster, Bigfoot, it was well, science fiction and fantasy novels and, and Greek mythology and everything in between. And it wasn't because anybody told me I should. This was just something that I was naturally drawn to. And while the world told me that those things didn't fit together, to me, that just wasn't true. Okay, let's get on to our next stop. While I'm luckier than some people that I know and that I grew up in a household where I didn't have my reading material, uh, TV, movies, and music restricted to religious-only things, to say that I didn't experience religious indoctrination from a very early age would be a complete and total lie. And most of it happened here at our second stop on the tour. I am parked across the street from St. James Catholic School in Gadsden, Alabama, where I spent almost six years under the authoritarian, totalitarian really, regime of Sister Frances Bruno. I'm not getting out of the car to show you this because this is a dangerous road to get out and film on, but let me tell you what happened here, okay? You had everything that you would expect from the Catholic schools. You had the uniforms. You had the nun running things. Now, they weren't dressed in their habits. They don't do that anymore. But uh, Sister Frances, she was the boss, and she wanted to let you know it, too. Okay, while I was here, it was mandatory every Friday, whether you were Catholic or not, whether you were even Christian or not, to attend Mass and sometimes even participate in it. Religion classes were mandatory. And, of course, this is the thing right here that got me later on when I went and changed schools. 
they uh, made you write JMJ for Jesus, Mary, and Joseph on every paper that you turned in, every test, everything. And, well, let's just say uh, that wasn't where it stopped with me, though. Uh, Sister Francis and I did not get along, and I'm not going to go into that story right now. But, anyway, this is where my involvement with religion really began. Okay, on to our next stop. Our third stop on the tour is here. I'm at Gaston High School, where I transferred to from St. James in 1987 and stayed all the way through graduating in 1992. Here is not only where I went through the culture shock of not only going from a private school to a public school, but being around non-Catholics for the first time. This is also the place where Thanks to taking science and journalism classes, I not only learned that I like science and enjoy science and was good at science and writing too, but also developed a show me attitude for anything. I never again just took anything on faith. Okay, let's go on to our next stop. Next up on our tour is this place. I'm on the campus of Gadsden State Community College in Gadsden, Alabama. By the time I got here, I had already accepted things like evolution and the age of the universe and all the things that science tells us, but there are other people who were not so enlightened or willing to accept it around here at the same time. And this is the place where I first witnessed cognitive dissonance in action. Over there is the science building, and in that building, I was taking Biology 101. I believe this was my first semester here, and there was another student who was studying theology. Well, of course, biology is going to talk about evolution, and things went fine until the professor started with that subject, and this student sat through the whole class silently, but his face started sweating and he was getting his skin was getting redder and redder and redder but by, by the end of the class he was sputtering with rage and by the time that I the class was over I went up to talk to him and I tried to point out like the uh, similarities between chimps and humans and the fact that they share like 98 99 something like that percent of their DNA with us and this guy just wasn't having it. And by the end of the class, he walked out of that class, even though it was a required course, and never came back again. Okay, on to our next stop. The next stop on this little tour through my scientific and paranormal past is arguably the most important, but also ironically the only one that I can't show you or even go physically to the location to tell you about because there is a uh, no trespassing sign on the property now. In 2005 to 2007, I lived in a little trailer on Bellcross Way in Southside, Alabama. And that trailer was haunted. Now, by the time I moved into that trailer, I had already had experience with other paranormal phenomena like psychic abilities, divination, like tarot cards, and even magic that told me that they were not only not the bunk that the scientific community wants you to think they are, but they're also not the bad things that certain religious factions would like you to believe. But this, I had never had any direct experience with ghosts in the afterlife, even though I believed in them, I never had any direct experience with them. Well, living in this trailer changed all that. It slapped me in the face with it. Now, at first, it was little things that you could write off as coincidence or, you know, just getting used to being in a new house, like I would have some strange dreams. But then, but then the uh, refrigerator door would open by itself and then 
one night I went to sleep with one channel on and woke up with another channel on. Things like that. And things like, you know, things would disappear and then reappear in another place later. But the biggest thing, the biggest story, was when this ghost started communicating with me directly through my clock radio in my bedroom. Now this is an imp this is important. I lived in an area that was a dead zone. You couldn't get TV reception without a satellite or cable. You could not get cell phone reception and you couldn't get anything on the radio either. The only thing that that clock radio was good for was beeping to wake me up to go to work in the morning. Well, one night, I'd gone to see a movie, and I called my friend Neil, who I've mentioned before on this channel, to tell him about it, and while I'm talking to him, the clock radio suddenly turns itself on and starts playing two verses from that song, old 50s or 60s song, Sugar Pie Honey Bunch, you know that I love you. And it start, and then it does it several times during the course of the conversation. Same two verses of the same song over and over and over again. Which, this was a clock radio. It did not have a tape deck or a CD deck or anything like that in there. So there was nowhere for this song to be coming from, but that was not where this stopped. This ghost actually proved to us that she not only was it a real spirit, but it was an intelligent spirit, not a residual haunter. And we know this because one night I had Neil come over to spend the night. While he was there, we were, we spent a lot of time in my bedroom asking the ghost questions, and she kept responding with that same song, those same two verses, over and over and over again, every single time we would ask a question. Well, I mean, this would have been enough to, that if a scientist had been there seeing it, he probably would have wanted to study it. Probably, we'll talk a bit more about that later in this video. But anyway, this happened over and over again, and at one point we wanted my brother, Nate, to witness this, so we called him to come over. Well, he gets over there, and he's over there for a good two or three hours, the whole time, silent nothing would not answer a question would not make the radio play finally Nate decides he needs to go home because it's getting late so he goes back home soon as he pulls out of my driveway and is driving down the road I kid you not the radio comes on sugar pie honey bunch you know that I love you Neil and I both looked in the direction of the clock radio and said in unison, smart ass! And this, I mean, I think that whole day that he was over there doing that, we counted 16 times throughout the day that this happened. So this was definitely not our imaginations, and it was definitely something intelligent and unseen. And that was just one story with this ghost. I have a lot of other ones. But we don't have time for it now. And you get the idea, though, that this was where I learned that the afterlife is definitely a real thing. Okay, on to our next stop. And now we come to the final stop on this tour down memory lane. A little place I like to call Home Sweet Home. By the time the events I'm about to describe to you took place, I already had several paranormal investigations under my belt. Now, the end results of the very first one are available to be seen online in an interview I did after the investigation. It's not my video, so I'm not going to show it to you, but if you'll get on YouTube and look up Paranormal Taxi Cab Confessions by Spirit Searchers, you'll be able to see it there. And, uh, nor are the events I'm about to describe to you either the first event or the last paranormal event that happened in this location. But 
they do involve a non-human spirit and the first time I've ever directly experienced poltergeist activity which is what happens when the spirits start manipulating physical objects. In March of 2014, I had an encounter in this house with what turned out to be an Islamic spirit called a jinn. Over the course of about two weeks and included a eight day investigation, there was a lot of poltergeist activity where things were being moved around and that included my laptop being thrown off of my dining room table so hard that it bounced on the floor but thankfully didn't break. The cups in the dog and cat food feeding bins were switched around when nobody did that. And the wallpaper on my desktop computer was changed. Now, as I said, I did an eight day investigation and during the course of that investigation, I caught a lot of evidence. More than I'm about to show you. Some of it because it's just not clear enough and some of it for personal reasons. But what you're about to see is what I believe to be a full body apparition and what most people that I've shown it to believe to be a full body apparition. Although some people say that it's just pareidolia or matrixing as it's called in the ghost hunting industry. And then in two audio files, EVPs, the first one of uh, it, what it said when I asked it what my name was, and the second one when I asked it what its name was. Okay, here they are. <laughs> Although some people want to write it off as light reflecting at weird angles, I find the photo very compelling because to me, there's just too much specific detail for it to be light reflecting in my mind and playing tricks on me. You can see a big bulbous head with a sword-like tongue lolling out of one side of its mouth. You can see the folds in the robe that it's wearing. You can see two wings that look like they're bat-like wings and a three-fingered hand holding some kind of staff weapon. So, yes, to me, that's just too compelling, but you decide for yourself. But in any case, I have enough other evidence to show that this happened and it was real. But in the end, I ended up having to get the help of an online psychic to get rid of this problem. Now that you've seen a little bit about what drove me to notice the things I did, ask the questions I asked, and connect the dots the way I did to get for the answers in the last video, our little drive down memory lane comes to an end. Please join me next time when we take a, another look at some of those dots as we take a closer look at the core mythology of science in part two of this series.